um, as Chris said, I am with ACTERA, and for those of you who don't know, we are a, a nonprofit based here in Silicon Valley, and we basically give people the tools to live more sustainably. And um, as the director of the stewardship program, what I do is oversee um, a lot of projects that we have related to land stewardship. So you might have been, come out to some of our volunteer work days. We do habitat restoration at many open spaces and parks and creeks, and including um, McClellan Ranch here in Cupertino. So we have regular work days where volunteers come to remove weeds, plant locally native plants, and in general help improve the habitat. Um, in addition to our, our wild lands and, that we do, we also help people restore their urban lands. So we have more you know, native vegetation in our, our urban parks and in our backyards because just having little pockets of, of natural habitat has shown to really boost up the insect diversity. And once you start boosting up the insect diversity, it improves the birds and improves all the other species. So today I'm going to talk to you um, I'm going to give you some of my experience first based off of um, my, own, uh, my own projects that I tried out in my garden. But increasingly, and those are you know, several years old, so actually I have several years of, of experience and I, I know that um, maintenance is not, or meadows are not maintenance free, so we'll talk about that. But um, in addition, you know, a lot of our restoration that we do in open spaces has really informed um, what we do in urban spaces as well. We've done lots of different test plots to see how is the best way to, you know, introduce natives into, in, uh, you know, an area where they weren't before and, and what sort of techniques work. So I'll go through all that today. And by the way, if anybody has questions going through, feel free to, to stop me. So um, as, we, as I said, we're going to talk about, you know, basically what is a meadow, uh, why would you do it, how would you do it, and then most of the presentation is going to be going over lots of slides of other projects and what worked and, you know, what were um, some things we learned, as well as talking about what kind of plants are important and maintenance for meadows. So first off, you know, what is a meadow? I think everybody has sort of different ideas of what a meadow is, but it's really kind of a flat, low place, typically at the base of a valley or something like that, which can be seasonably wet, and in California that means wet in the winters and springs, and then it dries out in the summer. And um, what you typically see here are grasses, and that's what we think of as meadows, but also a lot of forbs in a really healthy meadow, um, and, and annuals and wildflowers, things like that. So this is a picture of Jasper Ridge over by Stanford, and um, probably a lot of you have been there. But it's, um, it's a research preserve for Stanford, but what makes it really interesting is that it's a serpentine area. And so um, serpentine soils um, are some of the best remnant stands of our native grasslands. So if you really want to see what California might have looked like, or a little bit closer than what you typically see, going out to serpentine areas is, um, is really helpful. Actually, at Rustered Air Preserve, which is nearby to this, we've been doing a, um, a, some test plots over the past year uh, because there is an outcropping of serpentine soil there, so we're trying to figure out um, you know, how to restore that because right now that has the most uh, native, uh, best native diversity there compared to the rest of the park. And we're finding that, amazingly, scraping off the top five inches of soil and planting in a few of our locally native species, but the native recruitment is so much better when you can just scrape it off because you're removing the competition. And we have like four or five different types that we did. We used the same amount of irrigation. We planted at the same time of year. We planted the same sort of species. And scraping, we found really the um, success rate was just unbelievable. So. What, you know, what that tells us and how we can inform our urban environments is that reducing the competition from weeds or other things is really what will help your meadow succeed. I thought it might be helpful to mention what serpentine soil is to the people that are not as familiar with yeah, the soil. Yeah, thank you. And please feel free to jump in. You know, when you work with a bunch of ecologists and restorationists, you forget what, you know. <laughs> and not everybody lives and breathes this stuff. Although don't breathe in serpentine soil because it can be carcinogenic. <laughs> but uh, serpentine is actually our California state rock. And um, it is, I, I, I'm not even gonna try to explain, but it's basically it comes from deeper down and it has to do with our fault thrusts. So if you're going down 280 um, by Edgewood Park and you have you noticed sometimes the bluish rock that you see on the side, and in the springtime you'll see lots of little wildflowers. So that's what serpentine is. And there are 
Um, big areas, one in Edgewood, also one in Coyote Valley is another big serpentine area, which has wonderful native, um, native uh, annuals and grasses. And then there are also some of their outcroppings because of the faults around here. Okay, so here's an example of a naturally occurring meadow for inspiration. And then here's a, a picture that I saw a while ago from Bernard Trainer, who is a, a well-known landscape architect, and this is a meadow that he created. So this was an area that was full of weeds, and basically he recreated this California native meadow. So um, I'd like to show these two pictures because one shows what it occurs like, you know, naturally, but this is also that how you can try to restore something back to maybe what its former glory was. So, um, why would you change out to a native meadow? And typically, people are trying to, um, are usually changing out lawns to meadows because they kind of serve the same purpose. That, that open view that you get, you know, it's not covered with trees and shrubs, so you want to look out over it, you want to occasionally walk on it, but um, you don't want all the water and maintenance associated with the lawn. So, um, the, ob the obvious item that most people go for is that it uses less water. But I will say, if in a home environment, if you want it to look, you know, semi-green, it doesn't use zero water. Now, out where we are doing restoration sites, a lot of our areas we go with no water after the plants are established, after two to three years. But uh, typically in urban environments, we don't do that because the, what the plants do is they don't die, but they, they go dormant in the summertime. And so sometimes people feel like it's their front lawn or whatever, or front, you know, lawn, front meadow, that might not be acceptable. So. And how much you water is really, um, really dependent on it. You know, I say here for the first two years, it's um, you know half of normal water. These are very conservative estimates, um, and after that, it can be more like one sixth. I mean, you can really go because it depends on where you live. Some people water their lawn three times a week, and with a native meadow, you definitely can go down to once a week. It's still pretty generous for watering. And then um, some of you may know this, but there is a rebate program through the Santa Clara Valley Water District, and they're improving it all the time. Um, we've used this for some projects I'll explain a little bit later for the Palo Alto School District, and um, they've been really, really accommodating. Um, the trick is you can go to their website to get all the information about it, but um, the trick is that you have to get an inspection before you do anything. So oftentimes people will let their, their grass die and then they try to go get the rebate and they say, oh no, it has to be a living lawn before we can approve the rebate. So don't let your grass die until you get the inspection. And then once you do the notice to proceed, then you can, um, you can begin work there. Correct, yes, you do have to, it's funny, the first time I went through it, I was like, oh, this thing is so hard, but now that I've gone through it a few times, it's, it's easier, but yes, there is, you have to, as part of your application package, you submit a plan, like what species you're going to use, you do need to change up the irrigation um, to get the rebate, so, um, you know, th those are all things to consider, it's not like it's just free money, but if you want to do it anyways, it's nice to have some of the costs offset. Um, the big one I think with uh, why I like native meadows so much is the, the re huge reduction in maintenance. You know, we all see lawn mower, or people mowing their lawn, you know, once a week, edging, blowing, the, all the noise, the pollution that goes along with this. With you know, native meadows, you're really cutting them maybe once a year, sometimes twice, depending on, you know, what, you're, what look you're going for. But that's a real drastic reduction in maintenance. And not only just air and noise pollution, but a huge savings in costs, because most time people do outsource that. <clears throat> and then there are also all the habitat benefits you get with it. You get insects, and well, a lot of times people think they don't want insects, um, what you really find is once you start having a healthy ecosystem that's naturally balanced, you get a, a variety of different insects. So, you know, over the past, since I've really started going native, so to speak, I'm gardening all with native plants, you know, I used to have infestations of ants or, you know, yellow jackets and things like that, and I really don't notice any of those anymore. And there's some anecdotal reasons for why that might be, but um, it's really just you're keeping your ecosystem in check. And then I also like it because it gives you a real sense of place. Rather than seeing islands of bright green amidst golden hills, it's nice to have your meadow sort of reflect what you're seeing in the distance. And I think it's pretty. So um, 
there's a lot of information beginning, but then I will get to a lot more pictures later on. But I want to just explain things, um, try to answer some questions before we get into the case studies. So I would say the first step is really um, developing an appropriate plant list, depending on what you want to do, what uh, function the metal will serve, as well as um, your aesthetic desires and your site. So many people will have heavy clay soil, and so that definitely will inform what sort of plants you want to use. And I'll give you some suggested plants later. But um, you know, heavy clay is typically anywhere here in the valley where you are have something flat. And unless you're up on the hills where you have a more rocky chaparral, you most likely have clay. And that's what you hear a lot of people complain about. And so sometimes why people aren't successful or I should say why I wasn't successful when I start, first started planting with natives is that when you go to the nursery, they tend to have the really pretty um, showy plants that are easier to propagate, like a lot of the sages um, and, um, and sometimes manzanitas. And if you have uh, heavy clay soil, those, those, those plants are challenging. So I had several years of failures before I, I figured it out. And then there's also figuring out your exposure. How much sun do you have? Um, and then the function. You know, some people, they want it to function exactly like a lawn, and that probably won't happen. So, you know, that idea of being able to um, have, you know, play soccer on it, I've yet to find a native alternative for that. But I do have, you know, two small boys, a dog, and we are out there playing baseball a lot. They're running around, the dog's chasing the ball, and it can survive all those sorts of functions. But it's, you know, it's going to be a little lumpy. It's going to be looking different, different times of year. But it's nice when we can say the yellow patch is first base, and, you know, <laughs> the, the carrots over there is third base. And actually, my kids know what those are now. <laughs> and, um, you know, diversity, finding a, a lot of times, we go for what grass looks the most like a, a lawn, and so we try to do that. And there's some species we'll talk about that are really lovely. But you know, for a, a successful and real, really di a healthy meadow, I would suggest do, doing multiple species, and that also helps you hedge your bets. So I usually we usually do two to three grass species at least, and then several types of perennials and forbs, and then throwing in some wildflowers as well. So things will self-select over time. And that way you don't make a huge investment, and then if something doesn't work out, the whole thing's gone. And then I, we always like to plug um, locally native species. So, you know, as, as at Kara, we, um, we have a, a plant nursery that we grow all the plants for our restoration projects for, and um, we collect seed from the watershed. And increasingly, other, um, there are other water, uh, nurseries that do this as well, and the idea is that when you're um, planting your locally native species, first of all, they do better because they've adapted to this climate and the soil for you know millennia. And then also the, the native insects do a lot better too. You guys probably know this, but there are about 1,000 California native bees that are typically solitary, sweet little things that are just itsy bitsy, but a lot of them are very specific on the types of plants they like. So the more you can bring in diversity in locally native plants, you don't have to know exactly what you know what the relationship is, you just know you're you're doing the right thing. Okay. So there are several different approaches to changing out a lawn to a meadow. But all of them have the basic steps. One is removing your existing material. So if you have a lawn, you can do it a few ways. You can use a sod cutter, which is this tool that basically cuts down a few inches and cuts out the sod. But then you have to roll it up, it's quite heavy, it's, it's a little cumbersome. Some people actually flip the sod over and plant into it. I have not tried that myself, so I can't say how successful that is. Um, a way that we do it mo most often, because at a nonprofit, we obviously don't have a lot of money, so we are always trying to do things on the cheap. But um, we use a method called sheet mulching, and I don't know, raise a hand, how many people have heard of sheet mulching? Oh, look at that, a lot of people. All right, Bay Friendly is, is getting the word out. That's basically where you, if you had a lawn in place, you'd cover it with um, cardboard and about four to six inches of arborist mulch, and you let that basically kill the grass naturally because you're robbing it of light, but also that process is you're, you're letting um, the cardboard decompose, and um, six months later, you can plant into it and you actually move the, the wood chips away and then dig a hole and plant your plant and put the wood chips around. So we do that a lot, and you'll, you'll see some pictures of it. 
Um, sometimes you need to add soil if you remove if you're like using a sod cutter, removing a bunch of lawn. You want to put some compost back in. Or sometimes people like to, when they're doing sheet mulching, actually put down a layer of compost and then do the cardboard in, in the mulch. Um, and then you want to plant your plugs, um, your perennials, or native sod. Um, but that's, we'll talk about that's a little bit of a different experience. And then um, cast some wildflower seed if you'd like to. Um, mulch, mulching is always important. If you didn't do the sheet mulching method, then you would mulch here because that keeps the temperature of the ground cooler and it retains moisture and also gives it a finished look and keeps out weeds. And then the first year or so, you're going to probably do some weeding. So it's a little bit easier when you have plus, so you can see the difference between um, what you planted and, and what's a weed. And then you can cut or mow, like I said, once or twice a year as you, as you desire. So first, um, I'm going to talk about a few, my first few examples when I tried this out. So this one was uh, so long ago, probably, so, I used to remember how long, but I think it was like five plus years or something, just looking at the age of my kids and, and my dog. Um, so this was a lawn area that's heavy clay, and the winter got super wet and soggy, and then the summer would dry out and could never stay green. So um, I went to a you know, CNPS lecture and learned about native grasses, and so I thought I'd give it a whirl. Um, and so what we did here, you can see in the first picture, uh, was a sod cutter, and that's what I did. It basically cut up the, the lawn into these big chunks of, of clay grass, and we hauled those off, and that was very heavy. So like I said, after that one, we decided maybe sheet mulching was the way to go. But then we um, planted in a bunch of, about 200 little plugs of what's called dune sedge, or Carex panza. And despite the name, actually dune sedge can handle clay quite well. And also mixed in with some uh, some woodland strawberries, so you kind of you know again sort of hedging your bets to make sure that if the sedge didn't work, then then maybe the strawberry would. So you can kind of see after the first year what it looked like, and then you know this is a little funny color, but um, this is what it looked like just a couple of years later. And this is sort of midsummer, uh, very little watering, probably once every two weeks it'll get water but it's also not a full sun environment, it's about part sun. And in the fall, we bring out the lawnmower and raise it up to the high setting and just cut it once, and then that's it. So, um, you know, after this, my husband, who was a bit of a skeptic, being from the Midwest, was pretty sold on going native. <clears throat> Here was a second attempt of mine. We also did the sod cutter, but this time we sort of we just lumped it nearby and um, this time we did red fescue because I was really again searching for that native grass that was going to look like a lawn and so I'd seen some examples of the red fescue looking all nice and lumpy and lush and so I put in some plugs and you can see how it grew really quickly right away and um, this was spreading a little bit of compost in there as well. So over the years, um, you can see what it looks like on the left in wintertime because red fescue is a cool season grass. But you can see what it looks like on the right hand side. And um, I live in Portola Valley and this is full sun and um, where I live it actually gets hotter in the summer and colder in the winter. So it's a little bit harsher of an environment. But what I learned from this and actually after this is that red fescue I really only recommend for park shade situations unless you live on the coast or in San Francisco because you will always get it going this summer dormant and um, you'll try to water and keep it lush and you and feel like you're watering it just as much as your old lawn and it's extremely frustrating. So I would say part shade, I have it in some other areas and it looks great with again watering once every two weeks. So that was my lesson learned. Now the other lesson learned with this one is I thought I'd really test it out and see how dormant it could go and then whether it would come back for life. So last summer I just cut off the water altogether. And I um, found out you can't do that. So <laughs> half of it died and then when the half of it did die, then some weeds started coming in. So I had a little bit of a weed patch this spring. But um, I used, I have a lot of oak trees on my property and so oak leaf mulch is really excellent for getting rid of weeds and helping to bolster natives. So I basically just covered them up the weeds with oak mulch and then I waited about a month and planted in some natives and starting to fix my problem. So free or cheap ways to garden. 
But this is, you know, this is a picture of what it looks like in um, a spring after a good uh, winter's rain. And it is a really, it's a lush looking grass. But it, yeah, and also, it's not everybody uh, can, can like this aesthetic of the lumpiness. You know, you can see that I have some poppies in there. I have some other, um, there's some morning glory growing up behind the, the shade lounges, and that's actually purple needle grass behind it. So, you know, my family and I, we really like that wild look. It's really fun to walk through. You get different sensations all the time. We always see different things. Um, but, you know, it's definitely, it's not, not your typical mom. I have a question. How tall mm -hmm. is the grass? Well, the red fescue that we're looking at there, that does not get very tall. It's about six inches most of the time. The first year, sometimes it'll send up flowers that are almost like a foot tall, but it doesn't flower very high. But the needle grass in the back, that does get higher. That's about three feet high. And so, um, actually, I want to talk about that one too. That's one I like to just use kind of for off in the distance. That's a little bit harder to walk through. And the carrot panza that you talked about? The carrot panza, the carrot panza stays really short, like six inches. And then you can you can mow that, and it you know that's that's the closest thing I found to a lawn. I'm trying it in some really hot spots to see how it can handle it. But you know again, we get 100 degree days regularly where we live, so I use carrot spans in more Palo Alto that isn't so hot, and it responds really well. How often do you mow it? Then? I I just mow it once in the fall. Oh, the carrot spans. And usually they. Over a bit. How do you get it up so we can move? So the carrot spans, it doesn't seem to do that. The red fescue definitely mounts over. So um, if some of you have seen, you know, sometimes the lumpy looking grasses, and you know, if you if you stay on top of it like the first year and do a mowing, and then the next year you do a mowing, then you can kind of combat that sound. But if it does start to get lumpy, sometimes I just actually go through with hand shears and cut. And while that might sound a little bit onerous, you can get a really nice clean cut, and sometimes you might do it for half an hour one day and a half an hour another day, and you can usually cover a pretty good area. Yeah? When you say mowing, the uh, traditional lawn mower, you can't mow when it is tall. Are you talking weed eating? No, uh, we actually, so I have a lawn mower, it's so like a plug-in lawn mower, and you can get it to six inches, so on the carrots, oh. yeah, panza, that's what, that's what I use. And actually, even the uh, purple needle grass, I tried that in the spring. I cut it down right before it flowered. And then when it actually did flower, it was only like this high. And like, it's kind of a nice way to keep purple needle grass from getting a little out of, out of hand. I've been looking all over for, for a mower like that. Do you know the name of it? And the, it's like a Black & Decker that I got. Black & Decker. Yeah, from my hardware store. It's a plug-in one. You know, so it's always a little bit mm. difficult to use. But when you're only using it once or twice a year, it's OK. Wow. You have a lot of extension cords. And it will go six inches high? Uh, yeah, I'd say about, uh -huh. That's we, we definitely put it up on the highest, but it's mm -hmm. not too bad. And I know people use push lawnmowers, so you have a little more control there. And actually at our restoration sites, we, uh, we often don't use sides, you know, like old world sides, because you can get a really nice clean cut that way. So if you can find somebody who will side your meadow, I highly recommend that. Okay. My, my nine-year-old keeps wanting to try it out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so some of the things I learned from my first few meadows was basically using plugs and mulch so you don't have to weed too much. I tried not using mulch because I really was, you know, so smitten with wildflowers and I wanted to be this wild, colorful meadow. And um, it's just you get a lot of weeds in there and if you don't know what you're doing, it's very difficult to tell a native, especially if you have many different species, a native from a weed. If you have plugs, it's easier because then you can see, you know, what was your deliberate planting versus what was a weed. Um, somebody once had the suggestion, I thought it was a pretty good one, that you can actually sow, if you had like some wildflower seed, you could sow it in a flat independent of the meadow so that when they came up, you could see what was supposed to be there versus a weed. But that's, that's pretty time intensive, so that all depends on our, I usually, I think mulching just works, works pretty well. Um, and then the other point I just want to say is that, you know, the, the grasses and perennials really will be the things that stick around more. Um, I love wildflowers, I keep trying different ones, but really the only ones that will keep repeating tend to be poppies. So unless you live in a really neat place, like some chaparral or rocky areas, you can have clarkia and lupins and goldfields and they keep coming back. But most of us live in suburban, you know, clay lots and those species just don't seem to return. But poppies do. 
Actually, that's the other thing I mow. I mow my poppies. And I do it after the first bloom and mow them all down to the ground. And within a month later, they're back in blooming. So, you know, right now mine are on their second bloom. And um, you can even cut them again before they go to seed and they'll bloom again. Okay. So here um, was a project we did for the sequoias in uh, Portola Valley. And they, want, they had a lot of lawn there that they weren't using for like recreational use. It was just more something green to look at. So they wanted to do a few test plots to see what would be acceptable to their, um, their residents as well as the maintenance crew. Uh, so we did a test area for different types. We did meadow sedge, which is a little bit different from June sedge. The, the botanical name was Carex pregracillis, P-R-A-E-G-R-I-C-I-L-I-S. And that's our local, local meadow sedge, but it behaves pretty similarly to Carex panza. Carex panza, I think, is from a little bit farther south. Um, and then we did red, red fescue, and somebody wanted to try blue wild rye. <laughs> and then we also put the strawberries in. So this was an area that was like hard as pan, it was like hard as rock. It was just it had been blown of all topsoil by the garden crew for just years, you know, those types of areas to keep it looking neat, but it was just nothing was there. So we added about two inches of compost and then planted the plugs and mulched. And um, you know, they didn't put any irrigation in, so they did it by hand, and it was twice per week initially, and then once every week. And you can see, you know, within the space of oh, about six months or so, how it went from the plugs um, and how quickly it filled in. And this is the area we're looking at the meadow sedge here. <clears throat> and then this part is the red fescue. So you can see it, you know, a few months after installation and then once it's filled in. And if you look at this picture, you can see, you know, let's see if that pointer works. Yeah, kind of. That, um, that band right here. That's uh, the difference between red fescue and the, uh, the dune sedge. Oops, sorry, I'll finish that one. So, you know, this was a test plot, and I have to say the maintenance crew was pretty skeptical. <laughs> I was talking with them, but I was shaking their head. But, you know, at the end of this, when I went back and was taking these pictures in October, uh, you know, the, at the time the maintenance crew did say, wow, we can't believe how green these things stay, which is relatively little water, and we really like it. There's not a lot we have to do. Because we used the mulch there, it was very little weeding. Um, so they were really happy with it. Um, the blue wild rye, which I've shown pictures of, that one grew like as tall as corn. And they, and they had a weed whack and it came back again, so they were not so thrilled about that one. And then the strawberries, too. There are a lot of deer that walk through here, and you wouldn't think that deer would go that far down the ground to get uh, a ground cover strawberry, but they did, especially the beach strawberry, they nibbled those quite a bit. But the grass is in general pretty deer safe. Um, here's another project. So this is in Foothills Park in Palo Alto, and um, has anybody been up there and seen a huge lawn that they have down in the valley? So uh, that takes you know, hundreds of thousand dollars a year to irrigate and to maintain. Like they have a, a during the summer, uh, eight hours of a ranger's time to mow this lawn. So ideally, they'd like to transition it over time. Um, so we're, we sort of started on a very long project, but we do a little bit every, um, every season. And what we do is we um, do the sheet mulching technique. So you can see here in the left-hand picture, the, the grass, the old turf that was there, the cardboard that we just gathered from you know, various sites, and then the free mulch that we put on top. And um, <clears throat> since we have so many volunteers and so many middle school and boys schoolers, uh, this is actually a great activity, laying down cardboard, throwing down some, some wood chips. <coughs> then you can see about three months later, which is a little bit shorter than most, um, but you know we do it all the time actually, uh, we plant into it. So again, we're using volunteers, they move away a little bit of the, the wood chips and then they dig a hole and even after three months, actually a lot of the cardboard is already disintegrated. So um, it disintegrates pretty quickly if there's any ground moisture in there at all. So you dig a hole, you plant your plant, and then you put the mulch around it a bit. And so we've done this technique. Um, you can go out and see it. We probably have about 10,000 square feet now of this done. Um, you know, here's a picture of it. Um, oh, that little thing's still there. Oh, well. The um, picture of it at the at, at Foothills Park. You can see just how it's filled. And these were little, we call them tree band size, but they're basically just a little bit bigger than a plug. They're like this big. And that was, you know, a yarrow species. 
um, a sedge species. We have lots of different grasses, and you can just see how it's filled in over time. Um, I was really skeptical when I first heard about the sheet mulching technique. It sounded so funky, and, and it just the plants do so much better being planted in sheet mulch than they did just into the bare dirt like I had tried at home. So it was pretty nice, and it's so much nicer because you don't have to haul away the sod. It's all decomposing in place. <clears throat> so moving on to some other projects. So the. Um, Palo Alto School District had a, has the Sustainable Schools Committee, and they've been working over the years for to do composting and recycling at the schools. And um, then they thought they'd tackle the idea of you know of their landscapes because as you can imagine probably all of our schools they have the lawns that they use for play, and that was always going to stay there. But then they also just had a lot of lawns that were left over from the '60s when these schools were built, you know, circling them and um, using up a lot of water. Uh, so they wanted to figure out if they could do the same thing. So basically change out these unused lawn areas and use other sorts of native plants that still could be walked on periodically, rolled in, you know, looked at, etc. So um, what we did, we partnered with the school district and got some funding to uh, do a program where we started out doing this and not only did we change out the lawns to, to these meadows, but we used the children in the process. Um, nothing about free child labor. But although I'd say when they're first graders and second graders, it's sort of questionable how much benefit they bring. But um, you know, we, we did this and we incorporated education along with, with the project. So um, this site here, it was like a construction staging area and it was really hard packed. It's where they had parked all the trucks and um, all it had was this weed called bindweed, which is really the bane of my existence, but anyway, that was the only thing that was surviving. So what we actually did here is we sheet mulched here because we had such good um, results with it elsewhere. We thought it would help condition the soil and get it ready for planting. So we put down the um, cardboard, actually from solar panels, so it was all real like cycle of sustainability. So we put the solar panels on the cardboard and we were able to use them. And we put the, the wood chips down and, um, and you can see kind of what it looks like at the end of our of our of that day. And then you can see it just, you know, about a year and a half later later how it's filled in. So it really was a barren deserted parking lot now is filled with different things. And this was kind of a combination of they wanted to understand what meadow plants look like and they also wanted it to be an ecosystem garden. So um, kids in fourth grade typically learn about the different ecosystems of California. You know, the chaparral, the redwood, the woodlands, the the meadows. So we created each of these different ecosystems, um, not the baylands or the redwoods because we didn't have those available, but you, we tried out these different systems and then um, some Eagle Scouts did some interpretive signage. And this is by the Science Research Center of the Palo Alto School District so that when kids come out there then they can, you know, look and do insect surveys. Can you tell us what the school that is? That is right next to Hoover. So it's in between Hoover and JLS. There's that little funny road. It's kind of hard to find, but if you go on the bike path back there, you'll see it. Okay. I have a question about, like, how much does the school district actually save on water when they, you know, did your transformation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're we're working on that one. So this one, since it was there was nothing there to begin with, that one wouldn't qualify. But since then, like what we've done in a few other schools where we got the, the water rebate, we're actually tracking that right now, and we're tracking out different irrigation systems, like we did a Netafim versus overhead high efficiency irrigation, and um, we're starting to gather some of those results. So, um, and the other kind of thing that's funny is we always say, oh, you only have to put on the irrigation like, you know, once a week at the beginning, and then it's once every other week, and so every time we go back to these sites, someone has cranked it back up to once a week, so, uh, you know, I think it's just, it's hard for them to grasp that. But you know, that's probably why it got so lush so quickly, as you can see from the pictures, because a lot of times out in a restored era, they don't look like this when we plant them. So did the bind weed come back? <laughs> yes, it did. So that has been a constant scourge, uh, the bind weed. And so we've spent some time with volunteers removing it. We've had this discussion ourselves, well, what, what do we do with it? Because it seems like the bind weed like the sheep mulch just as much as the natives. <laughs> so uh, what we're doing is, Basically, we're trying to keep back the bindweed and letting, um, you see these phacelias and buttercups, the phacelias are the purple and the yellow buttercups are in there, they have prolifically sowed. 
So what we're doing, all these little babies around them, we're pulling up the bottom weed around them and just trying to get them, you know, established. And we have noticed a decrease in the bottom weed as soon as you get the natives up and shading out the ground a little bit, then the bottom weed is coming back less strong. Like the worst part's an hour in the path. I'm a little skeptical about sheep mulching Bermuda grass. Yeah, as you should be. I would try to dig it out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then if you can, then you sheet mulch it and you'll see some things come back, but they'll be weaker and you keep on it. But there was a patch of Bermuda grass in here and, we, and one of our uh, volunteers is tenacious with a fork. Um, and and she, she got it out and we rarely see it. So it was the bind weed that turned out to be harder than the Bermuda grass. Can you, well, if you put the plastic and you celebrate Uh, well, there's, it's funny, how they, if good anyone's on the Garden with Natives Yahoo group, I see this, this topic come up about once every six months. And <laughs> so I will only reiterate what I've heard other people say, is that it seems like anything you can do to knock it down and then just being diligent is really important. Um, in general, we, uh, you know, we, we've used solarization a little bit and we haven't had as much success as just frankly sheet mulching and staying on top of it. But prior to sheet mulching, I would just try to dig it out as much as you can to weaken it. Um, I think that's uh, be specific, but on the bindweed, I mean, like I've read, like the roots go to China, basically. Yeah, so, pretty much. So, I mean, have, when you say, you know, dig up the bindweed, how far are you talking about? Well, the bindweed, you can't really dig up that much. You're really, you're, you're kind of trying to get some of it just to weaken it, but uh, what we found, at least so far, is that it's more having the natives getting bigger, like allowing them to have some advantage and shading it out that the bindweed is less successful. Okay, so it's more dominant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this was one at um, El Carmelo uh, Elementary School that we did, you know, it's a traditional grass and we did the sheet mulching technique. And um, while we love to use uh, cardboard that you can just recycle, sometimes it's hard to find the amounts that you need um, because a lot of people luckily recycle their own cardboard. Like if you go to REI or some other source that we used to have, they actually send it back and, and recycle it. So we started buying this um, butcher paper from Linkso. And um, there's a thin paper, and if you do like three sheets of it, we find it works pretty well. Um, and the nice thing is you can see with these kids, they're unrolling it pretty easily, so that's fun. And actually, the, the type of construction paper that I have here is it has a corrugated edge to it. So um, it, that's actually, we just use one ply of that. And then we got our free mulch, and as you can see, the kids are rolling up the paper and putting the mulch on. And um, you know, you, at any point, you can always weave in a learning process. So basically, we're explaining decomposition and then how the worms that are underneath you don't see, how they come up, and they're helping you mix the soil. And then a few months later, we planted again these little plugs and tree bands and um, strawberries. And if this is a you know kind of a part shade meadow, as you can see, so this is actually red fescue because if it is part shade, I find red fescue is very fast and pretty grass to use. And then I do like to use woodland strawberry in shady situations as well, because as you can see, it's a nice carpet there. Um, so so we uh, did, did this was our first one that um, we did, and then since then we've done a couple other uh, uh, projects at this school, and the, one of the ones is the irrigation pilot that I told you about. And actually what we found is that the high efficiency irrigation, the plants responded better to it. And from, a, um, from an installation standpoint, it was, it was definitely cheaper, and with Netafim, um, I know a lot of people like it, I'm sure it has great um, uh, applications, but for a school it's harder because it's on top, and even though you cover it with mulch, when kids run across it, it's more apt to break. So um, this water district has now started allowing high efficiency overhead irrigation for meadows on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah? When you say that, are you referring to like the uh, rot MP rotators or what? Exactly, yes, MP rotators. And they have to be put in a certain distance from the curb so that it doesn't run off onto the street and things like that. Um, so in every project, you kind of have to weigh what, what's worth it. But it's good because before this pilot, the water district was not allowing any of that. They only allowed the, the drip irrigation to be part of the rebate. And so um, when you have a meadow, it's really a challenge to put a drip to each, to each plant. So based on what we just you know, found in our first year of the pilot, they said they'd approve it on a case-by-case -case basis. Have you done any meadows or have you pulled parts 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, at my own house, yes. <laughs> and actually, and also out in the field, we have lots of them in, in hard sun. And I'll suggest a few species that work better for that. <coughs> but um, yes, because I know in the full hard sun, unless you're going to keep watering a lot, even watering it once a week, you can keep things looking pretty decent. But. You, you know, the it wasn't a question so much as a comment, because if you're going to do uh, some wildflowers, you'll get better germination rates with overhead uh, uh, sprinkling mm -hmm. than you do with, uh, because it, 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 it pounds the seed into the soil a little bit, and I, I've had pretty darn good uh, results that way. Oh, good. That makes sense. It's more mimicking natural rainfall. Um, and a few other places if you wanted to go see what these things look like in real life. Um, another demonstration garden we did is at the Lucy Stern Community Center in Palo Alto. So if anyone's been there, um, there's this old scout house that's there. And we partnered with the city of Palo Alto to create a bay-friendly demonstration garden so people could see what native plants in the gardens would look like. And so this was another flat area that was just covered with vinca, and we removed it and put down some compost and they want to make a berm and the, the redwood bench there is from a redwood tree that had fallen in a nearby park and their, um, their parks group milled it for a nice bench. And um, you can go visit it anytime. I think it's been really successful. We used a lot of wonderful um, uh, compost that Linkso donated to the project and it's like, it's just such a luxury because we're, again, we're used to being out in the field where you're digging into some, some old dirt with a lot of extra invasive. So, you know, any time of year, there should be things happening there. And then in the, in the background, you see that the eco home, that's what that gray box is. That's a demonstration home that shows all sorts of eco-friendly things for the home, like the washing machine, the passive solar. And so in front of that, they wanted to have an you know, eco lawn. So we put in a, a native lawn there. And so that's about a year old. So you can see what some grass is. And that's full sun. Um, let's see if I have a picture of that. Yes, I do. Good. So this is full sun, and we use some species like June grass and um, an Idaho fescue. So you can see they're a little bit, you know, taller, but you can also cut them back. So this is in early spring. Typically with these species, I would cut them about May or June, depending on where you are and where they're flowering. So I like to let things go to seed because that always helps with your recruitment. But then you can just cut them back with, um, in this case, I would use hand shears. It's not that not that big of an area and you can get a nice cleaner cut that way than with a lawnmower but you could do it with a lawnmower so did you disturb the soil that was there already and just put the compost on top of it and plant in that mm -hmm. you didn't want to mix it in because you were afraid that no we, we, we sort of noticed that as you um spreading the compost on top and as you're digging the holes to put the little plants in and you know you're putting things in it sort of it mixes in on its own and then also as the rains hit it because, like, you know, all good native plant uh, gardeners, we like to plant in fall and winter when we get the rains. And it really starts to work the compost in naturally in a slower way rather than really intensifying in one little hole that might have problems elsewhere. So it kind of gives it a more passive approach. And also we're just lazy and we have volunteers, so. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, <clears throat> rodents, moles, go mm -hmm. gophers, yeah. foals that mix it in for me. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm wondering, what happens if you let the Idaho fescue just grow all summer and don't cut it back? So it would be okay. What I've found is that um, certainly for the first year, you can definitely do that approach, and sometimes it's nice to do that because then you let it go to seed naturally, it falls naturally. But by about the second year, clearing out thatch, i found, is really important. Because, um, you know, when you think about how our natural ecosystems evolved, they either had elk grazing it or occasional wildfires to really clear out that thatch. And when we don't have that, you have to sort of stimulate something. So without that, like I let my red fescue, I didn't cut it. When I was really stressing that with not watering, and I didn't cut it either. And I found that the thatch actually kind of suffocated some of the other things. So... Um, but the thatch is basically as the flower stalks, you know, bloom, and then as they senesce or drop their seed, they basically flop over. And so the first year you do that, it's just going to be a little bit. But then in the second year, you're going to get new stalks up in the front, and you still have last year's down that hasn't quite decomposed yet. And then if you let that go again, they'll have another one. And so depending on how profusely your, your grasses flower, you can just end up getting a buildup of thatch to the point where everything's 
you know, on top is kind of dead and suffocating stuff underneath and it sort of rots out of it. So a lot of times there's different techniques to do it, but giving things a haircut is the easiest way um, in spring or fall, depending on what you're looking for. And sometimes also people go around the base and just pull out the dead, mm -hmm. the dead grasses. Have you sometimes used a compost to decompose that patch around there? Is that I have not. Have you tried oh. that technique? You well, just sprinkle compost on it to speed up the process? For lawns, yeah. Oh. The mowed lawns. You know, yeah, yeah. Because then they don't have to do all that, you know, that, what is that thing that you, you poke at them? Oh, poke the aerator? Aerating. What they do in traditional lawns? Right, mm -hmm. right. The more compost, the less aerating. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's been a few sites where we just, um, for whatever reason, just probably like having your own garden, you're like, why won't this one area grow? It just isn't looking good or whatever. So then we sort of cheat a little bit and we go to Linkso again and get some compost tea when they're growing it. And we found pouring that on some new plants in the air bad areas have really had a good response. So again, it's not like it's not like miracle grow where it's going to be next week, but definitely over the span of a few months, you start to see some good growth. Ideally, you want to chop it up in place. So um, if you had enough time and you enjoy it, um, what I like to do is I clip off the seed heads and I cut them in about one inch stalks and just sort of sprinkle them up as I go around. So then they break up on their own, but as you said, it's a natural fertilizer for the meadow. So that's ideally the way to do it. And sometimes if you get like just too much all at once, then putting it in a pile somewhere else, you know, it's not on your plants or whatever, then they'll decompose really quickly. And then you can use that for other things. <clears throat> okay, so has anybody here had experience using the native saw from Delta Bluegrass? No? All right, I guess I get to <laughs> talk to a new audience because a lot of people around where we live have, have used this product a lot. So um, Delta Bluegrass is a company that does traditional saw, but about three or four years ago they came out with what um, they call it native California saw where you basically, um, like this is my next door neighbor, and they called up and they said, we want a native saw, and they came out and they cut up the lawn with the saw mower, laid this down, and when they left, this is what it looked like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, wow, that's really insta meadow, gorgeous. Um, their, their, um, their main blend that you go with, like a Nomo blend, um, that's a predominantly red fescue. So in this situation, it's under oaks, and it, it loves that, and it's great there. So it still looks like na that now. It doesn't get that much watering, so it's a perfect site for it. Um, in other situations, well, here's another example. This one is also the Nomo sod, um, but it was, this is right after installation, so you can see it looks, looks very lush. Um, but I just want to point out that I've seen it now about three years on, and in the picture on the left, it's in part sun. The picture on the right is hot, blazing sun, and while you might not be able to see it here, there's a lot of dead patches in that one. So again, it's, it's, since it's predominantly red fescue, the first year will look good and will take over a lot, to put them, and then when it gets that hot, hot summer sun, it's just, it, it doesn't like it so much. So, um, but obviously in the shady part, you can see how good that looks. They do have some other blends, like they have a native preservation mix that has things like June grass and purple needle grass that we've talked about. Now they are taller, but if you have a hot sun situation, um, they should be more successful. They also have a native bent grass blend. Have you ever had, have known anybody that's used that, Chris? That looks... They I, about it. Yeah, I've read about it too. They have these sample plots in Portola Valley. Delta Bluegrass put them out. And that's the one that looks the best. And it's all water. It looks just like you know traditional sod, but it's native. Doesn't require much water. But I'm a little worried because they've had to replace it twice since they installed it. So I don't know what's going on there. So well, it travels. What's that? It travels. It travels like like Bermuda and those others. It's oh, a okay. travel. Yeah. What's the species of grasses? The native bed grass is agrostis. I don't go in that one. But if you go to the Delta Bluegrass site, you can see that. So, um, Delta Blue Grass is, or the native sod is one of those that you get. You know, if you have a small area, it might be really nice just to have an insta meadow right away. Um, it's not cheap, but they really, I, I used to hear one price, but I've heard, talked to other people say, oh no, they don't quote that price anymore. So, I would encourage you to give them a call if you're interested.
they put it in for you always too. Right? They do put it in for you, yeah. So it really is like you can just phone up and have your meadow tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if that's cheating, you know, if the crowd that counts or something like this, you probably want to do a little bit on your own. So in summary, I just wanted to um, recap the different methods we've talked about. So um, you know, we, I just talked about need of saw. Uh, plugs is the technique that we use most often, have the most success with. And then we've also talked about seed. So going from left to right, you know, sod is by far the highest cost and seed's the lowest cost. But, um, you know, as far as installation goes, um, you know, sod is the easiest, or, yeah, sod is the easiest. Seed, while it's easy to throw out the seed there, it's really a challenge unless you know what you're doing to figure out what's the, what's the native grass and what's the weed grass. Um, and then plugs is kind of a, a nice combination of the two. And then, if you're wondering about what grasses might work, I, I listed here some local native grasses and then what sort of exposure and drainage needs they have. So if you are a good drainage, that means that your, your soil is either loamy or sandy. Like if it's, you know, kind of anything on an incline is pretty much good drainage. It's because basically when you see when you put water on it, you see how it runs off. Um, sunny, poor drainage means those kind of those flat areas that in the wintertime are, are soggy, swampy, but of course in the summertime they're like clay pan. Um, and the shady good drainage, that could be, you know, again, there's a lot of chaparral areas that have this combination as well. Sometimes under oaks you can have some good drainage because if you have a lot of oak leaf duff, you can um, kind of have that same experience. And then if you have shady poor drainage like redwoods, pretty much that sort of thing. So we put down here, and this is, you know, I'm sure if other people will disagree with or we put some of the X's because I went over this with like, you know, our botanist Paul Heipel and our nursery manager Deanna Juliana, we all argued about what exactly, you know, and so this is uh, the overall consensus about what, what would work well. Is this available? Yeah. Yes, it is. So you, you took a, a copy of the slides. Is that going to be, and I can post, I have a version of this presentation on Actera's site, but I will, I think it has this, but I'll post a new version okay. as well. So actera.org and, um, yeah, I can't remember where it would be. So, um, and does Actera sell grass plugs at this point? Um, sometimes we do. We usually have to, um, we, so we participate in the Native Plant Society uh, fall and spring plant sales. So you can always come to those times when we try to have a lot of grasses there and ask, answer a lot of questions because a lot of times people come with pictures of their front you know, lawn and say, this is what I want to replace. And so that's, it's fun. It's kind of nice. You get to do a quick and dirty uh, consult there. But if you know what you want and you know, let's say, um, you know, you want to plant this fall or something like that, then we can take some contract orders, but usually we have to have at least three months in advance. Um, to do that, and you know, we are a wholesale nursery. We primarily grow for restoration projects. So, um, if you, like right now, our nursery manager is doing a rare plant hunt with CNPS, you know, until Friday. So it's it's not like calling your local nursery. So that's my caveat. Um, but also, I should mention this. So we created this book a couple of years ago because we going to all these CNPS sales. Um, everybody shows up with their lovely, you know, Bornstein books, and they have all these plants from Southern California, things like that, and when we would say, well, we don't have that sage, but here's our local sage, and people would kind of look and say, well, I don't, I don't really understand, you know. So we came up with this little booklet that's basically San Francisco Bay Area Native Plants for the Garden, and it has pictures of the plants and the watering requirements and things like what to do for clay soils or what are some good lawn replacement plants. So we created this little booklet, um, and also we have a free iPad and iPhone app. So if you just search on Actera and the App Store, you can find it, and you can you can get this information there. You can create your own little list with pictures and share them with friends. So that's also a good way to get some information. And at the plant sale, we sell these for twelve dollars each, but they're also it's available for free. So. Um, well, I, you know, named some plants before. So let's say you do have a you know, dry or rocky soil. Um, these are some meadow plants that would work well for you, like June grass is good for that. Um, Melica, um, it's a really nice grass, and foothill needle grass. And then um, sort of flowering uh, 
forbs that you can have and they're really fun. Like buckwheat I really love because it's a summer bloomer. It really attracts insects. Um, and they have, there's a normal yarrow, there's a golden yarrow, as well as coyote mint. So if you have that rocky soil, there's really a lot of nice opportunities. Um, for like my garden, because mine's heavy clay on Los Trancos Creek, like I can't, I can't plant any of these. So I have chaparral and the, when I look at these pictures. <laughs> Alex, could you mention what forbs are to people? When... So, sorry, forbs are just, um, and we have had, had a discussion too, like what is the definition of forbs? And if you look at other several, so just basically, when I use the term forbs, I mean perennial plants that aren't grasses. So, you know, when you, I think uh, Fremontia had an article about six months ago talking about how we think of our um, California grasslands as being grasslands, but actually a, they think a higher percentage was for forbs rather than grasses. So, you know, things like yarrow would be a forb or, um, or the stages of the uh, caterpillar flower, those would be forbs. Um, and then here are some for uh, your seasonally moist clay soil. So again, things that get wet in the wintertime and dry in the summertime. So uh, the meadow sedge we've talked about a bit. Um, I haven't uh, touted the praises of oat grass as much. So Danthonia californica, it's, it's hard to find. And I know why it's hard to find because it takes a while to propagate from seed to get to a plant this big. It takes for a couple of years. So. It's rough even for us, but um, you know, I used it wherever something doesn't grow, I put this plant in and it always seems to survive. And it has, it gets, all it gets are these little flower panicles about this high, and when after they go to seed, you just use your hand to go whoop, and you can clean them up like that, and it stays greenish. It, it never gets bright green, but it never goes brown all summer long. So, um, I'm trying to use more of that. Luckily, I have my inside connection to the nursery, so whenever she has some, I, I grab some from her. Um, <clears throat> and then things like blue-eyed grass, I always like to throw those into our meadows because they're so lovely. Like those in buttercups, you know, they come out in February and March where a lot of other plants aren't flowering. So it's one of the benefits of living in California. You get your spring starting in February. <clears throat> So we talked a little bit about sod already, so unless anybody has questions about native sods, uh, we already said you know, the native mow free is basically better in the part shade and is lower growing. Preservation makes kind of more sun, but it's taller, and bent grass is sort of an unknown. Sounds like this should be cool though. I think Augie was trying it last time I just spoke with her, so maybe we'll see how it went. And some of the sites that I talked about today that you could go look at to see, you know, what this looks like after a few years being on the ground. Um, the Eco Home and the Bay Friendly Garden at Lucy Stern Community Center in Palo Alto. Foothills Park in Palo Alto. Um, usually people bring up the fact that you need to be a resident to go in there, so that's sort of a bone of contention. But we, uh, we do um, habitat restoration up there, and when you come and volunteer for a work day, you get to hang out in the park all day. That's one of the perks. So you can come look at that. Um, the Portola Valley Town Center, uh, we did a, a creek restoration there several years ago and we have quite a big meadow that's still there and doing pretty well despite being trampled all the time. The kids love it, which is so fun. And then they have these, um, the Delta Bluegrass, there's a, a soccer field there, they, they put Delta Bluegrass patches right next to the soccer field and they're labeled so you can see each of the different blends and, and what they look like and you can walk on them and things like that. Um, Federal College also has a lot of good demonstration um, areas. And then one of my favorite um, meadows that has been around for a long time, which just always looks so good, is um, the, at Stanford Hospital, there's this underground parking, and right in front you'll see a nice big meadow with some oak trees in there, and I don't know if you know, but it's, the, it's um, what's this word, it's from Rana Creek, you know, who did the, the Cal Academy roof, you know, mm -hmm. those wonderful projects, and so that was one of his earliest projects. Um, I can't remember his name. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely site, and um, it's, it's, you know, they're doing all construction around it. It's still staying in place, and it won some award as well. <clears throat> so, we talked about, you know, sources of native grasses. Um, you know, we, we can take some, some contract grows. Delta Bluegrass is the one that does the sod. Um, I'm sure you guys all know about Yerba Buena. It did move over to, um, Highway 84, but they have a lot of selection of grasses. They typically are bigger, like one gallons, so it's kind of a nice instant meadow, whereas a lot of things I'm used to planting are plugs or, or tree bands. 
Um, and then there's like green, uh, John Greenlee sometimes does some mail order plugs. Anybody else have any suggestions for where you get grasses? Central Coast Wilds. Yeah, that's right, Central Coast Wilds. <clears throat> and then I say your own garden, because really once you start establishing a meadow, um, I'm constantly just you know, digging up and dividing things. Like with the yarrow, I really like yarrow meadows, as you can probably see because in a lot of my pictures. Um, because it just fills in a nice carpet. It sends up the flower shoots, you know, and when you're done with them, you can just take hand shears and cut them to the base. But that plant responds really well by digging it up in the wintertime and, and taking out plugs and putting it elsewhere. It seems to really like that. What about seeds? Yarrow seeds? Mm -hmm. um, you can do that as well. I, I've done that where you take out, you let it go to seed and then you take them off and scatter them. Buying yarrow seed and, yeah. and spreading it around. Um, I think you probably have better luck uh, putting it actually in seed trays or in flats and growing it that way and then putting it into the garden. I find a lot of perennials, it's a challenge to get them to sow in place. I mean, other people have better experience, but it seems like any time I try to sow a perennial from seed, it just has not worked well straight into the ground. So oftentimes, like, same thing with poppies even. I never could get a poppy to grow from poppy seed, but I bought a poppy, and this is before I know, thank you. <laughs> but I bought a poppy and then I just let it go to seed and then I had, you know, hundreds next year. So somehow I just knew the right time, whereas I was doing it in fall, but obviously they aren't used to doing it in late spring, summer. Yeah. You know, I uh, got a, a, a little tray. It has uh, oh, 72 different plugs from Amazon. It's called a propagation station. And, you know, you can put a few seeds in each one of those. It has bottom heat. It's got a, a top to keep the humidity right. So there's very little work. You know, you put some water in it once a week. But other than that, you know. And uh, it costs 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. And it works really well. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, a lot of times people ask if we sell seed from our nursery. What we find is just the success rate is so poor, and since we hand collect all of our seed, it just we, we can't risk losing so much of it. So we always grow out. We, a lot of times we're small plants, but just even that, you know, it's a much higher likelihood of success. That was a propagation station. Mm -hmm. So um, the maintenance. We've talked about a few of these things as we went through, but um, you know, the watering it really just does depend. It depends on your site. Depends on the species you choose, and depends on what you what you're comfortable with. You know, native plants once they're established after two to three years, if you selected the right plant for the spot, um, you know they can go without summer water. They can, you know, they will go dormant. They'll basically go to sleep until the rains come back. But but that's how they are um, accustomed. But I say that with you know the right plant. So red fescue is not from this area. Red fescue is a little bit more to the coast. That's why when it's used so much because it looks so good, that's why it's not as successful without without extra water. Um, <clears throat> so the weeding I have to say is always heaviest in the first year, and then once you get your plants established, it's much less. But as I found with once my when I did kill some red fescue or. When the gophers were pushing up the, uh, helping to circulate the dirt, and I know gophers are good for things in general, but they, when they do clear out a big patch, like they like yarrow a lot, so they seem to keep going after my yarrow, it, it does create basically a vacuum, and nature does not like a vacuum, so then you typically get the first ones to come back, which are the invasive. So I don't want to say that it's wheat, it's maintenance free, you know, you have to sort of be on it, but it's, it's just very seasonal. You know, springtime, that's your weeding time. This time of year, I don't do much of anything out there. <clears throat> so walk through it. Um, cutting, you know, it's, this depends on what sort of look you're going for. Um, a lot of things that bloom early with their flower stalks, I like to cut in, in June or so after they've gone to seed so that you just have a smaller clump rather than the tall stalks because Sometimes people do have that concern when they see, especially like purple needle grass can get stalks up this high, and then after they drop their seed, their stalks look really dry, and people think it's a fire hazard. When you look at the base of the plant, it's actually rather, it's relatively green. Like unlike in the foothills where the, most of the European grass is, that's brown to the base. But a purple needle grass will be very green at the base, and that's because 
you know, their roots are going way longer than any annual grass does, and they're able to tap into that water. But because their seed heads look so dry, people think this is a fire hazard. So we do this oftentimes where we'll just cut off the seed heads once they drop their seeds. So you're left with a green base, and then people feel better about it. Um, and uh, as I said with my purple new grass this year, I tried my little experiment because I had some vulpia invasion, so I wanted to get rid of it. So I mowed it all to you know an inch high, and I thought, well, I might have done it in. And it responded just lovely. Like it uh, came back and it was much shorter, but it bloomed actually later because I had cut it right before it, it bloomed. So that was kind of fun too. So, you know, I would encourage some experimentation. And then I do actually do a lot of hand cutting. And because I have different species in my meadow, it makes it sort of easy. So depending on when something's done flowering, I'll just go in with my shears and just do some cutting. <clears throat> And um, I have to say also we have chickens, and every so often let them go free range in the meadow, and they really do a good job. They love the Idaho fescue. They just go crazy for it. They pull it all down, and they jump on it. Um, so we're doing some natural grazing. And then people always ask about feeding, and in general, I don't do it. You know, we talked a little bit about the um, about chopping up the seed heads and leaving the, the detritus in place, and that's a good a sustainable you know, technique. Um, adding in some garden, like if you compost your veggies every so often, if you want to dress some of it around in fall or winter, they certainly won't, uh, they certainly will like that. And then if you really have a tropical spot, you want to try that compost tea from Lingso. I mean, our success has been great with it, so. I, I mean, we wouldn't do it all the time, she actually had to, when they have it ready, you have to go over there and you have to use it within an hour and dilute it, but um, if you have, you know, if you're into that, it really can have a great effect. What's the dilution ratio? Yeah, that's a fair question. I, I got my hands on a bunch of tea and I don't. I yeah, I, you know, I don't even know because I'm sitting on all my staff. I have this one gal, she does all the school gardens for me, and so whenever she has a compost tea, she goes out and gets it. And I didn't even know it was so complicated. She's like, oh yeah, you have to get it. It can't sit in your car and you have to, to do it. So. <laughs> it's alive. Yeah. I, I don't have an answer for you, but. There's a great book, it's called Teeming with Microbes, and it'll tell you all about that. Yeah, I got that from the Master Gardeners. It's a, it's a great Well, I great think group. also, like, Lingsa must tell you, because somehow she knew yeah. how to, to, to dilute it. So yes. I'm talking about compost, you coming from a worm bin. Oh, man. Yeah, and it'll yeah. tell you how to make your own, and uh, yeah, how, how, to, how to keep it going. And yeah, it looks sick. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to close with also um, with meadows like um, like a lot of things you know it's different from what we grew up with at least what most of us grew up with we grew up with those really green perfect lawns that our parents took pride in um, you know going out and mowing them all the time and tending to them and that was really what people think of in the landscape and so I found that over the years of you know talking to people about replacing their lawns. Um, it's, you know, it's a challenge, and we've done a lot of public sites, and you get some people saying, oh, this is just beautiful, thank you so much for doing this, and other people are like, well, it's this weed patch. <laughs> and so it's, <laughs> which is, so it's, uh, you know, I, so the point of this slide here is to show um, an interpretive sign that we did for the El Carmelo School in Palo Alto, and we were getting some kind of negative feedback from some of the teachers, they didn't know what it was we were doing. So we put out the sign, you know, that if you can, if you can read it, it basically just explains, you know, what we're doing, the fact that we're integrating education with replacing um, the lawn of the meadow. And then we talked about the benefits, and, you know, some of these are just really objective that resonate with people. You know, the fact that Palo Alto irrigates and uses water for its irrigation from the Tuolumne River. I mean, so you think about how you're dewatering the Tuolumne for a lawn. Um, that, that resonated with me. It resonates with a lot of people as well. And then, um, you know, over time, I have heard a lot of neighbors come by and they say, well, first I wasn't sure, but it was so nice because they used to mow every week and then they'd blow and then they'd edge and now it's so much more peaceful. So, you know, some of these things are, as I say here, is change management from uh, my consulting days. Um, and, you know, you're never going to win everybody over and some people are still going to like that. But um, I assume since you guys are here today that you're, you're interested in learning about it. So, um, that's all I had planned for today, but I'm willing to take some more questions if you have them. Yeah. yeah.
practical question, like when you um, do the plugs, what's the density? I mean, how many plugs are you talking about, like, a, like say, a 10 by 10? Yeah, I say, um, so I would probably do one every square foot, but that's not very dense. Like, if you were going to use damp family uh, oak grass or one of those, you'd want to go more dense. A lot of times I'll do, like, a um, oh, grass every square foot and then try to fill in with some forbs and other things in between. Question. Question. Oh, she was asking what the density was for um, planting plugs. Oh. Yeah, and you said you were using shears. Yes. I mean, like what size shears? Like what is the right tool to get the job done uh -huh. in short order or relatively short order? Yeah, it, it kind of depends on what you are cutting. But the head shears, you know, the ones that, so the question was, what do you cut these grasses with? So the head shears, I find they're really great for the ones that stick up straight and you walk, 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 you know, walk through like this. And then um, sometimes with the, the carrots, like the, the foothill sedge, mm -hmm. at the end of the fall, they kind of go over like that. So a lot of times I just use my falco and go around and give them like a little hair turn like that. A falco and a small falco? Mm-hmm. But they're sharp, you know, so sometimes it's just easier. There are tools that are like a little scythe that mm -hmm. I use on a lavender. I just pull up the whole bunch and go like that. And that works on those grasses too. Does it? Is it I just bought one and I yeah. can't get it to work, so maybe you can come show me. Yeah. Just, it's like, I used to cut my hair by pulling it up. <laughs> so it's the same principle. Yeah. You know, just pull it up at the top and, and then wrap it off. That's right. That's what I've heard. In. I used to get them at Daiso, and at Daiso, it's, I mean, it's in other places, it's not in, mm -hmm. not in anymore. Um, common Ground mm -hmm. has them. That's right, that's where I see them there as well. Um, and, you know, we've actually, like I said, one of our favorite tools is the scythe, you know, but that definitely takes some time, and you have to be a certain temperament, because you can only scythe for so long, and then you have to peen and sharpen, and it's, um, it's very zen, but it's not for, um, not for everybody. <laughs> I have a scythe. You do? Yes. Well, I don't know if they're classes, but I know somebody who does do scythe training. So if you want me to coach you up with him, yes. And he actually he does do maintenance too. He maintains people's meadows with scythes and other sustainable techniques. <laughs> So I have dogs, chickens, gophers, voles. So they all eat it to some degree of, you know, it's just it's nature. So and bunnies, bunnies, sheep. I was thinking sheep. Um, so sheep. Uh, you know, I was. Do you have sheep? Or you're thinking no, about? No, this is an academic question. Oh, it's not. Yeah. You know, so that's that's a whole other discussion as well. Goats or sheep for grazing. Um, so we've we've had this discussion as well and talked to some people. It seems to me from talking, it's uh, goats and sheep are good as long as they're a part of an overall program. They're not a silver bullet, just like fire isn't a silver bullet. So if you have a field of yellow star thistle, it's hard to get a bunch of volunteers out there pulling all the yellow star thistle because it's just nasty stuff. So if you can get goats in there and get like 80% of it. You know, but they, they, they ravage the land, right? So, you, yes. you know, if you have natives in there, they're going to eat that down too. They're going to eat everything down. So, if you're just looking at a pure yellow star or oat area, you can let them do that. But then coming back for the, you know, for the fine tuning, that's better to use volunteers to do that, come in and, you know, get certain elements. So, um, grazing in general is like that. You know, the Coyote Ridge. Project. If anybody's been down there, this is what Stu Weiss has been doing with the butterflies down at Coyote Ridge. Um, uh, they're almost the, the, the what's the butterfly's name? Checker, Checker spot. spot. Thank you. The Checker Spot butterfly almost went to extinction because they rely on a certain plant that only occurs in the serpentine soil. Mm -hmm. As we talked about, there's not that many serpentine outcroppings there, and one of the best ones is in this um, in the Coyote Valley. And what he called the reason why I was so threatened was because um, there was grazing and then there was none. And then the fact that the Highway 101 was going through and releasing all the nitrogen, there was a fixing, therefore changing the composition. And then there was a third element too, I can't remember. But the idea is that, so he started introducing grazing, but the right type of grazing. So the idea that you have a small herd and you're constantly moving them, you're, you're managing for certain things, because again, that's how these plants have evolved with um, elk grazing, but they had a lot to graze on and they had mountain lions keeping their populations in check. So, you know, the idea that they, they, mo they eat and move on, they're not stuck in one place so that the plants have a time to recover. And that their hooves make little holes so that when the water collects and seeds there, it creates a nice little place for, for wildflowers to come up. So, um, a lot 
healthy things we try to mimic with our own processes, but typically closing in goats in a confined area, it's, it might be good for one thing, but it's not like a long-term strategy. Long-winded answer, sorry. Yes? Um, I had a, a small metal put into my front yard, and I had a little